Hey guys, Wilk here. So I'm really excited for today's video because although we've reviewed a couple of more entry-level folding style cockpits in the past, this is the first time that we've had a look here at the channel and my first experience with a tube frame cockpit. So what we have here today is the play seat trophy and I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who's wondering what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of a cockpit like this? What would be some of the reasons that you might wanna look at choosing a cockpit like this over a more conventional aluminum profile cockpit? Those are the questions that we're gonna be answering today. They've also sent us their TV stand XL to briefly check out in today's video too. So by the end of today's video, you should have a good understanding of whether something like this is gonna be the right type of cockpit for your rig. Let's get started. So to begin with today, firstly, a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Micro Center. Now, if you're in the US, you're probably already familiar with Micro Center as a fantastic destination for all kinds of electronic gadgets and gizmos from TVs all the way through to PC components, pre-built PCs and things like that. But what you might not be aware of is that they also range a increasing range of sim racing gear as well, which is really exciting for us sim racers because it means you now have the opportunity to get eyes on and in some cases even hands on with a lot of the sim racing equipment that we review here at Boost media before you part with your hard-earned cash. Now at the moment they've got some really awesome seasonal deals going. They've got a brand new store opening up in Charlotte early next year as well and they've just added a new rig building system to their website as well which you can check out to figure out what kind of components might suit your needs best. So for more information about any of this head on down into the description box for all of the links or visit your local micro center today. So back to the play seat. Now a couple of important things for you to be aware of. Firstly a big thank you to play seat for sending across this cockpit as well as their monitor stand for us to check out. Now we don't have any sort of affiliate relationship at least at the time of producing this video with PlaySeat although we do have some Amazon affiliate links down in the description below. PlaySeat is a pretty mainstream brand so there's a lot of different resellers and retailers around the world. If you do decide you'd like to support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost then you can use those affiliate links down in the description below but it would definitely would pay with this particular product to shop around yourselves. Local resellers may well stock this item and it might save you a little bit of cash in terms terms of shipping. So shop around, but if you do want to support us, links down in the description below. So let's get stuck into this guy now, starting off with pricing information. So this particular cockpit, the Play Seat Trophy, is available in a couple of different configurations in terms of the colors. Uh, there's a Logitech edition, which is that kind of crayon gray color, which is quite cool. Uh, there's a red edition like what we have here and a standard black edition. But of course, things can change over time. So I would recommend jump on their website and check for yourself what different versions of this are available at the time that you happen to be watching this video. So the the cockpit itself comes in at 599 US dollars or 990 Australian dollars. Obviously check your local pricing as well at your various different resellers. So it sits it at a pretty interesting point in the market because at face value, it's around about the same price as plenty of the aluminum profile cockpits that we've looked at in the past here at Boosted Media. But none of those cockpits that we've checked out in the past include a seat, whereas this has an integrated seat as we'll be discussing in more detail a little bit later on. So if you're looking at buying a cockpit and then buying a seat on top of that, generally speaking, to get a seat that's worth having, you're looking at around about sort of 200 to 350, maybe 400 US dollars for something really decent. Anything less than that, unless you're buying something secondhand or from a wrecker or something Something like that you do tend to have a few issues with flex and just things not being quite as you would want them in a sim rig so to just give you a couple of points of comparison here from my cheat notes uh, this is just cockpits that we've looked at personally in the past and we can sort of cross reference against so track racer tr120 you're looking at around about 673 us dollars at the time of recording this but of course it doesn't come with a seat so you're going to need to add that on top so quite a bit more expensive overall something like the next level racing fgt elite which is an aluminium profile cockpit that comes comes in almost the same price in terms of Australian dollars, but again, no seats. So you're looking at a couple of hundred dollars on top of that. And then something like the GT Lite Pro, which is more of a folding style cockpit, that does have an integrated seat, but it's not really the same kind of class as what this is here. That's more designed for people that need to be able to fold something up and tuck it away when it's not in use. Whereas this is gonna be probably more of a permanent installation in your living room or your man cave. So it sits at a pretty interesting place in the market. There's not a whole lot of competition, at least in terms of things that we've looked at in the past. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this stacks up against some of those other things that we've had experience with in the past. Now, when it comes to cockpits, there's three things that I like to analyze. Firstly, I like to look at rigidity. So making sure that the wheel deck, the pedals, the seat back and everything in between isn't moving around and flexing while you're driving. Cause that not only interferes with muscle memory, but can also diminish and dampen the uh, sensation of force feedback through your hands. So rigidity is very important. Adjustability is the next thing. Doesn't matter how good the cockpit is if you can't get it to fit your body shape right. 
right? So we'll definitely be analyzing that. And then lastly, expandability, which I think is gonna be a little bit interesting with something like this when we compare it across to an aluminum profile cockpit, simply because with aluminum profile, you've got the ability to bolt things on pretty much wherever you want. Something like this is obviously a little bit more limiting in regards to that, but it does have a much more elegant appearance, at least subjectively to me anyway. So this is something that I think you're more likely to wanna have sitting in the middle of a living room. Now, just to quickly touch on assembly as well, this does come flat packed. They do provide a video assembly guide on their website, as well as written instructions that come inside the box. Very easy to follow. Uh, we didn't run into any snags whatsoever. We did find one part of the uh, headrest here was a little bit difficult to get into place, but certainly nothing overly challenging. We didn't need to hit it with a rubber mallet or anything like that. Didn't require any drilling or sawing or anything drastic. Everything fit together nicely. No issues with holes lining up or anything like that. So I would say to get it to the point that you see it here unladen without your sim racing equipment mounted on it, expect it to take probably a little bit under an hour and then maybe another hour on top of that to get all your rig and everything set up, cable management done and uh, all those bits and pieces. So maybe two hours in total to get it all set up and then a bit of time to adjust your seating position and get it all optimized and you should be good to go. So let's get stuck into the details now starting with compatibility. So you've got pre-drilled holes for both the wheel deck and the pedal plate for most mainstream sim racing hardware brands. So your Logitech, your Thrustmaster, Fanatec, uh, Mozza, Sim Magic, all not gonna be a problem fitting on the wheel deck. Uh, the pedal plate even has compatibility for brands like Husingvolt. So pretty much anything, you can see uh, in some of this B-roll footage now that there are slots everywhere there. And a lot of more high-end pedals actually come with their own base plates these days too. So worst case scenario, you may just have to drill a couple of holes just to bolt in from the underside on this plate. But we'll take a look at the details and adjustment a little bit later on in today's video. Now, one thing you might notice is the absence of any way of mounting a shift. Now there is a separate accessory available from PlaySeat. I think it was about 130 Australian dollars on Amazon last time I checked. Uh, and that basically just bolts in. You can see there's a couple of little holes here on either side, so you can mount that on either side. And it basically just gives you a flat surface to mount your shifter and handbrake on, similar to what you've seen in some of our next level racing reviews. Now they do include inside the box, a couple of little bits and pieces for putting everything together. But one of the things they do include is, um, some of these little washers, which you could sit up against the edge of the tube frame here, and that gives you a flat surface that you then could bolt a piece of profile to or a piece of wood or something like that. So there are creative ways you can come up with to mount other accessories and bits and pieces, but obviously not being aluminum profile, you are a lot more limited in that than what you would have with the channels available on an aluminum profile cockpit. Now, another thing that's just to mention in terms of compatibility as well that I was a little bit disappointed with, there wasn't any cable management included in the box at all. So that was a little bit interesting. In their assembly guide on their own website, it actually does show some little Velcro cable wraps that they've used to mount cables around, but nothing included inside the package, at least in our case, which was a little bit disappointing. Being an aluminum tube frame cockpit, I feel like there is an opportunity to even have some little cutouts in the frame maybe. I'm not sure what kind of impact that would have on rigidity overall, but if you had a little cutout just here, and uh, another one down here, similar to what you see for the cables on a mountain bike, for example, that would potentially give the opportunity to pass some of your USB cables through the frame and not have them mounted externally because it is such a nice and sleek and clean looking piece of hardware. It'd be nice to be able to retain that sleek look by uh, having provision for those kinds of things. But unfortunately not the case here, not hard to just wrap a couple of cable ties around. We'll talk about cable management when we get all our hardware on here a little bit later on. So that's compatibility covered in terms of hardware. What about compatibility in terms of body shape and size. So there is quite a bit of adjustability available here. They say that this is suitable for drivers from 120 centimeters all the way through to 220 centimeters. I'm about 190 centimeters. Weight wise drivers from 20 kilograms, so small kids all the way through to 122 kilograms. At the moment, I'm about 90 kilograms for reference. So that brings us quite nicely into adjustability. Now there's quite a bit that you can do here, but obviously nowhere near as much as you get with an aluminum profile cockpit. So let's start off with the pedal plate down here. You can see there's a series of various different holes down the bottom here. One of the things they advertise with this cockpit is that it is uh, adjustable between a more GT style and a more formula style seating position. So we'll show you that later on too. But you can see there's two different mounting holes on this side here, up and lower position, and then a few wrapped around the outside here as well. So you simply just remove these guys, shift them into the position that you need them, and you're good to go. And if you have a look at the back side here, you can see there's these slots that allow us to actually adjust within that range. So if I loosen this guy off just for reference here now, so it'll slide up like so, 
and then we can lock it into that position, move it up and down. So there's quite a lot of adjustability there in terms of the pedal tray. Moving over to the seat, we're gonna come back to the wheel deck in just a moment, but the seat does have quite a clever way of adjusting it. So if we pop this bit off just here so we can see in the side a little bit better underneath this little flap, you can see there's a little bolt here with some holes inside this little tube piece here. So what I'll do is I'll loosen that off quickly now and I'll show you how this can move around. So I've removed the little bolt from under here in both sides and that now allows us to pivot on the bottom part here and basically just slide that tube in and out. And there's a huge range of adjustment here. So this is the maximum point. And you can see how just how upright that is. Uh, I can't imagine that would really work for anybody other than a small child. There is some adjustment down here as well, which I'll show you in just a minute, but that can go all the way back to a very, very, very reclined position about here. So you can imagine that is pretty much as far back as it's gonna go. That's gonna have you pretty much pointing up at the ceiling, but then you can also loosen off these bolts as I've just done off camera. That actually allows us to slide. It's a little bit awkward to do, but it actually allows us to slide this whole thing in and out. I'm probably not gonna be able to do it easily on the table here, but you can see you kind of have to do both sides at once. And it kind of just slides in like so. We'll go all the way to the minimum just so you guys can see. So not something that you're going to be doing while you're sitting in the rig or anything like that, but it's not too difficult to do. You just kind of got to work away at it slowly like this. Almost there. There we go. Then we just secure it back down into position. You can see now that's kind of brought everything in and you can see how that would be suitable for a much smaller person with the seat more upright like so. So pretty significant amount of adjustment there between a more upright GT style driving position and a more formula style driving position. But the one caveat that we have here is that we unfortunately don't have a lot of adjustability in terms of the wheel deck. So you can tilt this assembly up and down and it is nice and rigid. We'll talk about that more when we have a wheel deck on here later on and we can test that out properly. But that is one complaint that we had with the admittedly cheaper next level racing cockpits that are foldable. I felt like the mechanism here just wasn't anywhere near as strong as it could be at the price point. There's no reason for it to you know, have as much movement as it did in those videos. Happy to say that this is a really nice solid looking mechanism that they've designed here. So we'll comment on that more once we've got it mounted in, but you can tilt the wheel up and down, which is great. What you can't do, however, though, is raise or lower the wheel. So it is gonna be in a fixed position. Obviously tilting the wheel will have an impact on how high or how low the top of the wheel is, but obviously you're gonna be angling it at the same time. So certainly not as much versatility there as you get with an aluminum profile cockpit where you can move your wheel up and down to get it in exactly the position that you want. So you're gonna find there's a little bit of compromise involved here in getting everything kind of set up in the best possible position to ultimately end up with the wheel in the correct position for your particular chosen driving style. So build quality wise, we've already touched on a few aspects here, but overall the impression of quality is very, very good with this cockpit, especially when you compare it to something like those cheaper foldable cockpits from Next Level Racing that do have quite quite a few compromises in them. Now, admittedly, they are a lot cheaper than this is. We do have higher expectations for build quality here, but you know, even just down to things like the quality of the worlds, they're not absolutely fantastic, but they're perfectly adequate. You know, they're not the same kind of quality that you'd find again on a mountain bike for comparison. And all the fixtures, hardware, mounting points, bits and pieces like that are very, very nice. Even just down to small detail, like the little gauge that we saw just here before to give you reference between the left and right hand sides. All very nicely finished. You can see this actually got some sort of coating on it here. This part here is actually aluminium, but the rest of it uh, is some kind of steel. I'm not sure if it's stainless or what exactly it is, but a magnet does stick to it. I did notice, however, that a magnet doesn't stick to the pedal plate or the wheel deck. So those are gonna be either aluminium or some kind of stainless steel that is not magnetic. Either way though, they do appear to be relatively rigid as you'll see a little bit later on in today's video. And yeah, look, just as I said, overall, a very high overall build quality. Something that to me at least doesn't look massively out of place in a modern day living room, for example. Even just coming back down to the pedal plate adjustments that we looked at before, you know, nice stickers around there, very nice finish, nice plastic knobs, uh, all very high quality hardware throughout there as well. And then we get across to the seat, which is probably going to be one of the more important factors here. Again, remembering that this is an integrated seat, not something that you're going to be replacing with a different type of seat. So this is made out of what they're calling ActiFit breathable material. Now, on the sides here, it's kind of more like a, almost like a wetsuit kind of material. It's kind of got this neoprene kind of feel to it. And then in the middle here, it's all a mesh fabric, quite a bit of padding there as well. Now it also utilizes what they're calling a frameless design here. So you can see it's all kind of comprised of straps and bits and pieces underneath it, which allows you to kind of adjust tension. Uh, there's little Velcro pads, which you can tighten or loosen depending on your body shape. And there's also a lumbar support hidden away 
under the back here as well, which is also adjustable. So when you lean back in the seat, it kind of uh, provides a varying amount of uh, tension against your back as you kind of lean back into the seat. So your bottom kind of pushes up against that. So again, we'll comment on comfort and things like that when we're up and running in the rig a little bit later on. But look, in terms of the overall presentation, build quality, all absolutely fine. I did just notice a little bit of a loose thread here where, uh, where they finished off the stitching in one area, but otherwise all very nicely upholstered. And of course, if you do happen to own one of these cockpits, let us know down in the comments below what your experience has been like. Has it stood the test of time or have you noticed significant signs of wear and tear over the period that you've owned yours? Let us know down below because that's always very valuable for the viewers. Now, just quickly before we move over to the TV stand and then come back and put our hardware on this rig, also just want to quickly touch on weight because that was another thing that actually surprised me here. Uh, the entire rig, as you see, it here unladen is only 16 kilograms, which did actually surprise me because it is quite a bit lighter than an equivalently sized aluminium profile cockpit. Remembering that aluminium profile kind of relies on an internal structure within the profile itself to give it its rigidity. So there's actually a lot more physical material involved in the design, whereas this is relying more on the bends and the rigidity that's inherent in the actual physical layout of the structure overall. And that's what gives it its rigidity as a whole, which means they don't have to have as much physical material in the, uh, in the structure itself, which obviously saves weight and a little bit of cost, I would imagine, as well. And just lastly as well, for those who might be wondering, the footprint of the cockpit, as you see it here, is 138 centimeters long by 58 centimeters wide, and then 101 centimeters tall. That's obviously gonna depend on how you angle the back of the seat. So a relatively small footprint as well. But let's move over quickly now and talk briefly about the uh, TV stand, and then we'll come back and get the hardware mounted up on this guy. Okay, so quick look at the TV stand XL which comes in at 299 US dollars. Now I have a few issues with this thing. Firstly I feel like even though it is very 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 solid as you can see it's it's built like a rock but it, it seems to me like it's almost over engineered. There's a couple of aspects to it that just don't really make any sense to me. The major issue that I have with it though is as you can see here it only goes up to 100 millimeters for its VESA mounting pattern, whereas most modern TVs these days have a 400 millimeter VESA pattern. We were planning on putting our 55 inch Samsung TV that you see in most of our review videos onto this guy and using this moving forward, but because it doesn't have that mount, we simply can't do that without you know, purchasing some sort of an adapter. Now, the usual workaround that I've done when we've built our own TV stands, like what we did for our triple 65 inch 4K rig that you guys might've seen, is uh, just mount a standard VESA mount with, uh, with rails directly onto the profile. But there's an issue with that as well, and that is simply that the way they've designed these brackets, you can't actually adjust the spacing between these two pieces of profile. They're in a fixed position. So that means that unless you've got a vase amount that is exactly the right size to fit between these two channels, then you're just simply out of luck. You're not gonna be able to mount anything there either. And it just doesn't make any sense to me why they would over-engineer it to this extent with these massive brackets here, because all it really needs is just a couple of corner brackets in each side just to mount the profile like so. And then you'd have full adjustability. You could move it in and out, you could move it up and down, and you could do pretty much anything you want. Same goes for the feet on this thing as well. They're you know, ma made of this pressed um, steel, and you know, there's no reason why you couldn't just use a piece of aluminum profile down there to achieve the same thing and still give you adjustability and movement range and all those important things. So while it's nice and solid, I just don't really see why they've made some of the design choices that they've made. And then if we spin it around as well, on the back here, I'm just gonna lift it up quickly. It's very, very heavy as well, but you'd expect that for something that's designed for big TVs. But on the back here, you can see they've got this integrated shelf. But the strange thing is that it's not actually a shelf because they don't give you a piece to go across the top here. So if you wanna actually use this to put anything on, you're gonna to have to go out and source a piece of wood or a piece of pressed aluminum or a steel or something like that to put on there. Again, for the price, it just doesn't make any sense that they would put that on there, but then not complete it with, uh, with the finishing touch. And then you might've already noticed in the footage as well, these brackets haven't been properly painted either. You can see it's just kind of overspray and you can actually see the silver shining through on the bare metal underneath that black. And it was the same on the front as well. If I spin it back around again, you can actually see in these areas that silver is showing through. So yeah, there's definitely some work to be done there in terms of uh, quality control, I would say, and maybe some re-engineering required. But at the very least, they should be including some sort of a mounting bracket that allows you to mount a standard 400 mil VESA pattern TV onto this guy, because without that, it simply doesn't really serve the purpose that I think it's advertised for. It says it's a TV stand, 
and most TVs aren't gonna fit on it. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but for what it is, it is nice and rigid. It is, you know, for the most part, pretty well presented as well. So yeah, unfortunately, we're not gonna end up using it for this review. We're gonna go back to the TV stand that we normally use. You can buy 100 to 400 millimeter VESA adapters for, you know, 20, 30 bucks on Amazon, but you know, then I'm gonna have to wait a couple of weeks for it to arrive and whatnot. And uh, it's just a pain and something that I don't think, especially when you consider how expensive this thing is, it just seems like a pretty obvious oversight. So anyway, let's go back to the play seat trophy now, get our hardware installed and get up and driving. Okay, so time to go through the setup in all its detail with all the hardware mounts but before we do that, I just wanted to quickly ask a favor of you guys. Now, you might not be aware that only about 30% of the people that watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel. Now, I know that these days, uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference to you when you subscribe to a channel because the newsfeed is generally made up of videos that are pushed based on uh, what the algorithm thinks you guys like to see. But where it does have a really big impact is uh, telling the algorithm that this content is valuable and useful so that it pushes it out to other sim races that might not have seen our content before. So it's a small thing that you can do, which really does go a very, very long way to supporting us here at Boosted Media. And we really do appreciate your support with that. So head on right now down below, hit that thumbs up button and the subscription button if you do find what we do here of value. But let's jump in now and talk some more about this cockpit. Okay, so at this stage, all our hardware is mounted. I've actually been driving on this rig for a couple of days now, but I wanna just rewind quickly first and talk you through the experience of actually installing the hardware, and then we'll get into what it's like to drive with and our final conclusion. So look, in terms of the wheel deck, no real issues. Of course, there are gonna be some fringe cases with some more obscure wheelbases that might be a little bit more tricky to mount, but just like we expected, uh, the Fnatic base, no problem at all. This is a DD2 that we have mounted here, but CSL DD, the older discontinued bases like the CSW 2.5 and so forth, will all be absolutely fine. And the new uh, CSDD and CSDD Plus will both be okay as well. That also has the same mounting pattern as all the other gear from Fnatic, so not an issue. Bases that aren't quite yet mainstream or don't use a mainstream mounting pattern, so say your Acertec bases, for example, you might have a little bit more difficulty mounting those. Worst case, you're just gonna have to drill a couple of extra holes in the plate and make sure you have them positioned in an area where it's not gonna interfere with any of the stuff underneath. But I'm confident you'll be able to find a solution for most scenarios. Pedal-wise, a little bit more tricky simply because there's there's so much more variation in the different styles of pedals that are out there, how they mount it. And we can't judge them poorly for, you know, not making it easy for every single set of pedals that are out there. So just to give you an example, bolting something like your Husting Veltz uh, pedals or the VRS pedals that we tested with the rig, uh, they were absolutely no problem. They just bolted straight on. Uh, the Fnatic CSL Elite V2 pedals were pretty tricky to get mounted simply because they require you to be able to get the bolts in to drop down through the sides of the thing. And if you check out our full review of those pedals, you'll see exactly the reason why. But yeah, quite difficult to get in the sides. And then because the pedal tray has the sides folded up, you can't get your hand in there. So you've kind of got to line everything up and then push it through. And uh, you'll see in the footage, Tom and I actually kind of still struggled even with the two of us to get everything aligned. But once it's in, no problem bolting down. And that was all absolutely fine. So. Again, it's gonna depend on the pedals that you have. Some are gonna be easier than others. But again, I'm pretty confident you'll be able to find a solution in all cases. Looking in terms of adjusting driving position, no dramas there either. I was able to get into a comfortable position. I did find that the wheel deck actually ended up being in the right place, even though you don't have adjustment for the wheel deck height itself. Everything else around it can kind of be adjusted to fall into place around the height, around the fixed height of this. And obviously, as you tilt it up and down, it does raise and lower the uh, the wheel as well. So it didn't really end up being an issue for me. But what I will say there, though, is that the angle adjustment that you have on the pedal tray is more, I guess, to kind of get the pedals to be in the right spot relative to the somewhat fixed seat of the pants position and wheel deck position. So even though, as we saw before, there's a heap of adjustment in the backrest and you can also adjust in and out down here to bring the seats kind of closer or further away from the deck and the pedals. What you kind of end up having to do is fix that in a position around the height of the wheel deck so that it's comfortable and correct, and then kind of adjust your pedals and your backrest to kind of suit that, if that makes sense. So even though you have a lot of adjustment available in the pedals, you're kind of going to be limited by your body shape, I guess, rather than so much the driving style that you're trying to achieve. So for that reason, at least for somebody of my size, remembering again, I'm 190 centimeters, so 30 centimeters below what they say is the maximum. I would say that they're claiming, and I'm going to read this uh, verbatim here, they, they're their claim was uh, that you can change the seat position to suit any racing style. I, I wouldn't say that that's false, but I would say that it's probably a little bit of a stretch or an embellishment of the truth there. A bit of a, bit of a marketing speak, I would say, because 
Yeah, I, I can't get this into a position that I would say is a formula style seating position because you'd want to have the bottom or the seat of your pants a lot lower. That would then allow you to angle the wheel down more and then the pedals would end up resting a little bit higher. So you can imagine if I'm in a reclined position here and I put the seat back even further, I still can't really get my feet up without hitting the bottom of the wheel deck here, which is a fixed position. And then the pedal tray can't really go up any higher than it is right now without it also moving closer to me as well. And then because I can't really slide the seat any further back than where it is now, I'm kind of locked in. So you can see how it's kind of limited in that sense. But look, that said, my uh, Simlab P1X cockpit that I run for my daily driver rig, I've got that set up in a very similar seating position to what I have. This is somewhat of a hybrid position between Formula and GT style. So you're still relatively reclined, but it's comfortable for both driving styles. And I'm absolutely fine with that. I think that, you know, given the small footprint of this, the, you know, how easy it is to get in and out of as well, those things are somewhat acceptable, but the reason I'm calling it out is simply because, you know, if you were to just read the marketing material, it kind of makes out that it's, well, it, it does make out that it's completely adjustable between formula and, uh, you know, upright seating positions. And I really don't feel that that's really the case in a practical sense. So I just wanted to make sure that was very clear, but look, otherwise, absolutely no issues with the setup whatsoever. Everything was very, very straightforward. So no real hiccups other than just a little bit of difficulty mounting the uh, V2 pedals or a lot of difficulty, I would say in fairness. It was, it was quite cumbersome, but most pedals are gonna be easier than these to work with. So let's move on now and talk about what it's like to actually drive with this rig, and then we'll get into our conclusions. Okay, so what is the play seat trophy like to drive with? Now, I'm gonna start right from the very beginning here. From the moment I jumped into this rig, I was immediately thrown by just how immersive it is actually sitting in a frame like this that doesn't have all the extra paraphernalia around it like what you have in an aluminum cockpit. Now, one of the complaints that I see quite frequently and one of the complaints that I have myself quite often is that you often have a bit of upright which kind of sticks up beyond what you have for your wheel deck. And that's necessary before, you know, obviously having the adjustment for the height of the wheel deck, but you do always have that aluminum extrusion kind of sitting around you and in front of you. And, you know, it, it is immersion breaking to an extent. And because I've driven with with aluminium cockpits exclusively, or aluminium profile cockpits exclusively for so long now, I kind of just desensitized myself to it. But the moment I jumped in this rig, I was like, wow, this is actually really cool because all you see when you look forward is literally just a little tiny bit of frame on either side, just down near your feet. And uh, then just the steering wheel, the base, you don't really see the wheel deck because it's kind of hidden behind the wheel, uh, at least with this particular wheel that I'm using here. And uh, it's just a really, really immersive experience jumping in. You feel like you're sitting in some sort of an open wheel, a race car. You almost expect there to be wheels just kind of sitting there, which I think is really, really cool. And I can imagine a rig like this would be really amazing actually sitting in front of a massive projector or something like that, because you'd be able to see all the way down to the ground and it would be a really, really cool experience. So that might be something that we'll have to experiment with a little bit later on down the line. But I wanted to mention that because I think that that is something that, uh, well, it's something that I certainly hadn't really considered going into this. Um, I was expecting that there wouldn't be too many reasons why I'd want to choose something like this over the aluminum cockpits that I'm used to. But that was, yeah, that stood out to me. So I thought it was worth mentioning straight away here. So let's um, go through this. I've made some cheat notes here uh, so I don't miss anything. We've been driving with this now for a couple of days and you know put quite a number of hours of usage into it uh, under a couple of different scenarios just to sort of try and test things and see exactly how things go. So let's start off with, uh, let's start off with the good points. The first one being uh, that extra immersion that I had that I wasn't expecting. Uh, second one is a good amount of adjustability overall to result in a comfortable seating position. We kind of already discussed that in quite a bit of detail in the previous segment. So I won't go all through that again, but in terms of driving, didn't have any issues with comfort at all. In particular, the seat is extremely comfortable. Didn't have any issues whatsoever with my back kind of bulging out when I was driving either. That lumbar support actually does make quite a significant difference there. So it's really important that you pay attention to the instructions and install that correctly. When I'm pushing on the brake pedal, 
Uh, obviously, as you push in, it does slide your bottom back in the seat and kind of push you against the back of the chair. And there is a little bit of movement in the shoulders as you would expect for a seat like this. But where you really want to have a lot of rigidity is between your foot and your butt cheeks where you're kind of pushing back into the seat. And that is all really solid here, which is really, really good. So no issues at all in terms of comfort or ergonomics really at all. As I mentioned before, I was able to get this in a very, very comfortable seating position with no issues. Uh, quite easy to adjust as well. Now, we've kind of already covered adjustment pretty extensively, so I won't go through it all again now, but just little tiny attention to detail things like the fact that all the holes lined up without any issues. And even just down to where the uh, pedal tray slots in between the, uh, between the frame, there's actually a little plastic spacer, like a plastic sheet that sits up against it. And that allows the pedal tray to slide up and down really smoothly without binding up and scratching paint and things like that. So they've obviously put a lot of a lot of time and effort into refining the design, I guess I would say. And those little details definitely do make a difference to the experience of owning and using one of these from day to day. So that is another positive as well. Easy to move around too. One thing that I really liked about this, uh, particularly on this tile floor, because it's just a tube frame sitting on the ground, you can pick it up and slide it around very, very easily. Carpet is no issue either. Tiles would be fine as well. Obviously you just wanna be careful if you're on a wooden floor or something like that, that you don't mark the floor, but you could easily put some little felt pads underneath it as well. And that would make it nice and easy. And as I mentioned earlier on, at 16 kilograms unladen, it is relatively light as well compared to a lot of other cockpits that we've tested in the past, which again, makes it quite easy to move around. So that brings us to rigidity. Now, another thing that surprised me with this cockpit is that it is actually a lot more rigid overall in the wheel deck, the pedals and everything than I was perhaps expecting just looking at the thing. Now, as I said, this is the first experience that I've had with a more upmarket tube frame style rig like this one. And honestly, just looking at it, I expected there to be a lot more flex than what we actually actually resulted in, which is really, really great. So let's go through and talk about it methodically now. You guys will be able to see in footage for yourselves while I'm talking about this, so you can make your own judgment here. But I'm gonna talk about what I'm actually perceiving when I'm driving, because I think that's the most important thing. So look, there is a little bit of movement uh, in, the, in the wheel deck, where it's a little bit different from what you might have experienced with some other cockpits in the past is that usually when there's flex in a wheel deck, it's coming from the pivot point on the wheel deck itself, or maybe where it's bolting to the uprights on an aluminum profile cockpit, for example. With this cockpit, there's a little bit of flex, a tiny bit of flex in multiple areas within the frame itself. So you've got a tiny little bit here, you've got a little bit between here and there simply because they've made the upright a little bit lower so you can get in and out of the rig nice and easily, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, and then you've got a little bit here as well. Well, so what that kind of means is that overall, when you're doing hard braking, when you're pushing on the steering, which most people naturally tend to do when they're driving, there's a little bit, tiny bit of flex everywhere in the rig, but because it's spread out over quite a large area, you don't notice a lot of movement in any one particular area. So I think, you know, if you're looking at the footage and you're seeing the movement of the wheel deck relative to, you know, my body or the, my seat back or something like that, it probably looks a lot worse than how it actually feels when you're driving the rig. So. I'm not perceiving really any movement in the wheel deck at all when I'm driving, other than maybe just a little bit when I push into the wheel or under heavy braking. But what I would say is that jumping out of this rig and then jumping into a different rig, which doesn't have as much flex in it overall, the force feedback in the steering wheel does feel a tiny little bit sharper than what it does here. So I think, you know, the compromises that you're making in terms of overall rigidity to have a cockpit of this style, which is gonna integrate nicely into a living room, for example, is probably worth it for the majority of people. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a reason to move away from something like this, but having said that, it certainly isn't completely flex free either. So a point for consideration, but something that I don't think is gonna be an issue for the majority of people, at least in terms of the wheel deck. Now pedals is gonna be a little bit more complicated because it's gonna depend on the pedal set that you're driving with. Now we tested this on a variety of different pedal sets. We've got the Fanatec CSL Elite V2 pedals on here now. We also tested with uh, VRS pedals too, which are quite a bit stiffer than these are. And uh, those mount directly to the pedal tray. So I kinda wanted to test these with a bit of a worst case scenario to, I guess, see how much flex there was inherent in the tray itself before we account for a uh, aftermarket pedal tray, which obviously adds a little bit of extra rigidity like what we have on the CSL Elite V2s here. So with the VRS pedals attached, Look, again, you can certainly see some flex on camera. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and you know, talk that down. There's definitely quite a bit of flex there. That is noticeable to me, having come from a rig that is completely solid, no flex at all in the pedal tray. Now, I think where I draw the line here between something that I'm gonna complain about versus something that I might be making excuses for is um, the fact that I feel like there's no reason why this couldn't be improved, why the design couldn't have been better 
uh, to, to begin with. We've complained about this sort of thing uh, with a couple of other rigs in the past. I remember back to when we did our review of one of the earlier revisions of the track race to TR160, for example, there was quite a bit of dip in the pedal tray, like what you're seeing in the footage here. And uh, we went back to them about that. They actually ended up adjusting the design to add some ridges along the underside to add a little bit of rigidity so that it didn't tend to buckle so much under, uh, under heavy braking. And that made a absolutely massive improvement. It transformed the experience overall of using that pedal tray. So on a nutshell, Unlike with the wheel deck, which I think is acceptable, I'm gonna pick on the pedal tray simply because I do think that it could be better without adding a massive amount of additional cost to production. There's a couple of things they could do from you know just using a slightly thicker material to adding a couple of extra bits of reinforcement there that would make a significant difference. Even if it was just a couple of pieces that you could bolt on there just to give you a bit of additional reinforcement underneath, I believe it would make a big difference. And we've seen that improvement on other products in the past. Now look, in a practical sense, I think that's one thing that you do need to understand is that it is a consistent amount of flex. So it's gonna have the effect of making the pedal feel a little bit more spongy underfoot than it would other otherwise be on a completely solid mount, but it is gonna be a consistent amount of flex there. So I don't think it's gonna have an impact on the muscle memory side of things so much. It's more just, you know, if you're spending a ton of money on a really expensive set of pedals, obviously you wanna be taking full advantage. And this is something that will have an impact on that side of things. But otherwise, look, I think for what it is, the rig does a very good job. That's one area I think could be improved. Otherwise, flex wise, I'm actually quite impressed with the thing. I think it's a lot better than I expected it to be coming into this. So otherwise, in terms of negative points or points of improvement, I've got written down here, no cable management included. Now you can see we did do some cable management here with just some uh, Velcro straps that I had laying around. Not everybody is gonna have things like that just laying around. So that is one thing that, uh, you know, I, I just see absolutely no reason why they wouldn't include something like that in the box. So they could definitely fix that pretty easily, I would imagine, something I hope that they do. Uh, we already talked about no height adjustment for the wheel plate and the impact that that has overall. So. Again, I, I think that you know, if, you, if they were gonna add some sort of a mechanism here to allow you to adjust the height, that is probably gonna introduce flex as well. So all things considered, I'm pretty happy with the design there overall, but that may impact some people, which is why it is in my list of negatives there. Uh, as we mentioned earlier as well, the claim that you can change seat position to suit any racing style, I think is a bit of a stretch. We already discussed that, so go back in the video in the driving section if you wanna see a little bit more about that. Uh, then other little tiny bits and pieces here, obviously in terms of expandability, you're not gonna have anywhere near the ability to bolt extra peripheral devices onto this like what you would with aluminum extrusion. No real surprises there. It's not really a, a nitpick about this cockpit in general. It's just a sacrifice that you're making when you have a cockpit of this style in general. So not really anything more to say about that. Uh, one other little thing to consider there as well is the fact that due to the design of this, you're not gonna be able to easily just bolt a motion system onto this without some sort of a platform underneath it. So just another thing to consider as well if you intend to go deeper into the rabbit hole of sim racing. But overall, I've got to say that it has been a much more positive experience with the cockpit than I thought it was gonna be. As I explained earlier, the extra immersion that you get from sitting in a cockpit of this style that kind of resembles the frame of a real life open wheeler race car is something that really surprised me and something that I think does uh, to an extent at least uh, cancel out or at least offset some of the negatives that we've discussed in today's video. So where it sits with me is, look, if honestly, if I was uh, if I was choosing one of the cockpits out of all the cockpits that we have here at Boosted Media to put in my living room as a sim rig and something that was likely to get past the missus test, then this would probably be the one that I would choose. I'd be happy to live with the small amounts of flex that we have here and there and the other sacrifices that we have to make for a cockpit of this style to have something that's gonna integrate nicely into a modern living room, look, not look particularly out of place. And yeah, look, it's just a really elegant, really well put together, really well thought out rig overall. And for that reason, I really don't have any major reason not to recommend this. Uh, not, same can't be said for the, uh, for the TV stand that we looked at earlier. I know we only touched on that briefly, but there were a couple of things about that that, I, that just didn't make any sense to me. And I definitely think they should at the very least uh, make it so that you can mount a, uh, a TV with a 400 millimeter uh, facer mounting pattern on it because it's advertised as a TV stand 
and most TVs aren't gonna be able to fit on it. So yeah, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But the cockpit is really good. No issues at all recommending it whatsoever. I think it's relatively fairly priced as well. When you consider the quality that we have here, the fact that the seat is integrated and the seat is actually really good too. That was, uh, you know, that was something that did surprise me as well. I wasn't expecting it to be this good. Again, compared to the experience that we've had with similar design seats in the past on some other admittedly cheaper cockpits. But yeah, I think for what it is, it does a surprisingly good job. And uh, I think that if you buy one of these things, you're definitely gonna be satisfied with it. So uh, as you go deeper down the rabbit hole of sim racing, it may be something you wanna look at upgrading into an aluminum profile cockpit, just to account for all the extra peripherals, button boxes, motion systems, all those bits and pieces that you might wanna be adding later. But if you're just looking for a bare bones cockpit that gets the job done, does the job elegantly and cleanly, and doesn't look out of place in a modern living room, then I think that uh, this does a really good job and it's as simple as that, guys. So I really hope that today's video has helped you out. If it has, please do leave a thumbs up. Also, if you aren't already, please do consider subscribing to the channel. I know that it doesn't make a big difference in terms of what you see in your news feed these days, but it does make a big difference to us. And uh, it also does help significantly in uh, making sure that these videos get pushed out to more sim racers like you guys so that they can be educated in all of these things. So thank you very much for watching guys. And I will see you again very, very soon. Bye.